Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm so excited to bring to you today Dr. Day, who's going to be speaking to you on Let's Get to the Heart of the Matter, Ideas and Product Training for the Cardiovascular System. So I would like to introduce to you at this time Dr. Jay Vanden Heuvel, who has a very prestigious uh, resume here. He's from Green Bay, Wisconsin. He has a PhD in holistic health, a PhD in traditional naturopathy, a PhD in integrated medicine, uh, reflexology, flower therapy. He's a board-certified holistic health practitioner. He has 19 years of private practice experience and over 17,000 clients. He's a lecturer all across the world, as you can see in the U.S., China, Israel, Mexico, Canada, and the United Kingdom. He's lectured to over 100,000 people. He is the author of Life is a Teeter-Totter, 10 DVDs, and over 100 published articles, TV, and radio. So, so excited to have him speak to you today. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. J. Hello, Dr. J. Can we hear you? Hey, there I am. There you go. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. All right. Hello, everyone in Canada. It's Dr. J. Van Nabel. Sorry about that little mix-up. Uh, and thank you, Rancho, for that wonderful introduction. Today, we're going to be talking about circulatory system. So sorry about the little technical snafus. Technology is wonderful until it doesn't work, right? So anyway, I just had the uh, prestigious pleasure to uh, teach this module across Canada. And so uh, luckily, we are recording this for you so that you can go back and, and view it again and again and again uh, because the information is intense. So as you're listening through this, um, you may want to take some notes. It's one thing to talk about the system. It's another thing. Uh, to bring in the information and experience along with it so that all the slides make much more sense as we go through this. So um, sit back and enjoy the ride, right? Okay, so how many of you out there have a heart? Hopefully all of you do. Uh, this is just an anatomical overview of the heart, which is a huge specialized muscle within our chest. And you can just kind of see here that there are some chambers and some valves and kind of gives you a representation of what's going on here and how this heart is going to be pumping blood uh, throughout the entire system. So when we say the circulatory system, we're not specifically saying, well, it's just the heart. No, we're going to be talking about the entire anatomy. So as this heart is pumping out blood in red, red denotes it's oxygenated, and it goes through the entire body, it loses some of that oxygen picks up some waste products like carbon dioxide, right, and returns this back to the lungs to start all over. So this little slide here is just a representation to kind of get you to understand uh, what's happening. We have major vessels, and these major vessels, the aorta and the arteries, are broken down into smaller and smaller components or tubing, arterioles, and eventually capillaries. And the slide doesn't do it justice because these capillaries then turning into venules, veins, all the way back to the major vein, are very, very tiny, these capillaries. They're like threads, like hairs. Um, and they stretch out a long way. So if you were to take out the heart and take all the vessels, including the capillaries, out of the system and lay them end to end, this, this, this entire system would stretch about 100,000 kilometers. That's a long way. So imagine the type of work that this heart has to do and express throughout the entire system. So when we talk about circulatory, we are talking about the health of the heart as well as the arteries and the capillaries and the veins. So the whole 100,000 kilometer system. And there are issues that can happen to the system along the way. Most of these statistics may be United States type of uh, statistics, but I checked, they are very similar in Canada. So we're just going to call it from this point forward, North America. Here you can see there's about 81 million people in the U.S. that have some form of symptom or problem that's happening to the cardiovascular system. The number one, as you can see here, is high blood pressure. That's the biggest point 
because if you think about it logically, let's take a second to think about that logically, if the heart is pumping blood and it has to go 100,000 kilometers before it comes back, any type of resistance or problem in that tubing and plumbing the entire way could be compromised. So it serves common sense that there may be resistance along the way. And if you had resistance, typical symptom here would be the blood pressure could go up. So these tiny little capillaries, right? Even major vessels have any resistance or blockage. Uh, of course, the heart's going to have to work harder to get that blood to come back. So if you think about it logically, you can understand very quickly that high blood pressure blood pressure is a common symptom or ailment. We also see that coronary heart disease is another big part of it. And coronary really refers to the vessels that come off uh, the aorta right by or on top of the heart. And their job is these little vessels feed your heart. So your heart gets the best blood, it gets the most oxygen. So if there's any blockage there, we call this coronary heart disease. And then we have angina, which is uh, a very powerful cardiac pain. It's not a chest pain. It's much more intense than that, but indicates cardiovascular problems. And then also a heart attack, also known as myocardial infarction. So these big words, we need to understand what they mean. Myocardium just means muscle of the heart, and infarction means death. Not something we want to experience. And then, of course, stroke, where we have clots and then heart failure itself. So there's a lot of things that can happen through 100,000 kilometers. For example, let's just look at some of these stats, right? Every 20 seconds, a person in the U.S. has a heart attack. Well, how many heart attacks have happened since you started listening to this webinar? And roughly every 40 seconds, someone may die from that. And roughly talking 92 people an hour. That's a very powerful statistic. And of course, it's February, it's heart month, and this is why we're talking about this. This is definitely what I consider an epidemic. I don't concern myself with measles. Yeah, we know that that's been in the news lately, um, but we're not talking about 92 people dying an hour. So this is something that we really should be paying attention to at all times and the purpose of this webinar. Again, February being heart month. With the exception of 1918, cardiovascular disease has been the number one killer in the U.S. and also the number one killer in Canada since the 1900s. So North America, this is our biggest risk. It is our biggest worry and concern. And a lot of times problems with this system may not even show up. They just come about and boom. So the more we know what it is and the problems that we have, the more we're going to start understanding what we can do about it. So one of the things that is often checked and looked at and talked about is cholesterol. You know that. Many times we get our blood drawn, levels can be checked. Maybe our physicians may be inferring to us that we need to get on some kind of prescription. But I want to kind of lay down the groundwork of how important this particular molecule is. It's not a demon, and we need to stop looking at it like a demon. We need to start understanding that it's a necessary molecule. And it will build hormones and steroids and cell membranes and line our nerves or neurons. Now, the interesting part here, I'll just take a second to think about this. How many cells or cell membranes do we have in the human body? Now, it's been estimated there's about 100 trillion. That's a lot. And all of those cell membranes that you see in the body are like walls or coverings or coatings of every single cell. And guess what they're made of? Cholesterol. Also, the lining of the neurons, our nerve cells, or myelin sheaths, are also made from cholesterol. So if we didn't have cholesterol, we'd have a problem. So having a good cell membrane, a good neuron, good hormones, ensures operation of the body. Would we want our cholesterol too low? If we did, that might hurt the cell. It might hurt the neuron. And that's a little bit different information than what's being talked about uh, on national levels. Of course, good nutrition helps make sure that it's all working in a proper way. And we want good cholesterol. We'll talk about that in a minute. And also, cholesterol does something very important in, in this 
thousand kilometer system, it heals leaks. Linus Pauling, he got the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for discovering vitamin C. And he did a lot of work with cardiovascular. And he's noted as saying that cholesterol goes up to heal leaky vessels. So if you think about this, none of us really want to leak. So wouldn't it be interesting to think about this in a different way? Uh, I ran into a woman uh, while I was traveling to Nanaimo, to Vancouver Island, and she was sitting on the plane next to me, and you strike up a conversation, and she had just visited her physician, and she said to me, I've been having my cholesterol checked for years, and it was always normal, and I'm 53, and recently I had my cholesterol checked, and it went up, and it's the first time ever. I eat a lot of fish, I eat a lot of vegetables, I'm very thin. Uh, I'm not your typical high cholesterol candidate. And she was wondering why. Um, I said, you need to listen to this recorded webinar uh, because cholesterol can go up to maybe even heal a leaky vessel. That's not the only reason it can go up. You'll see that in a second. So we have to start understanding that just because our cholesterol goes up doesn't mean uh, we need to panic. There are reasons your body does this. For example, I've often taught this uh, around the world, that cholesterol and it being high could be a myth. It's not all bad. It's a building block for many hormones. If you didn't eat it, your body would make it. It's made in the liver. And think about the liver. The liver gets a lot of work. It gets overpaid. It gets forced to do a lot of different things throughout the day. And one of its jobs is to make sure that if you don't have enough to make it so you have good hormones and cell membranes and neurons but also if you have too much to break it down but sometimes what happens is our livers don't always break it down there may be something like too much sugar in the diet and a high sugar diet will elevate something called triglycerides so this is a level you want to pay attention to normally if you see high triglyceride levels you're going to see that the diet is implicated, that there's too much processed or refined or simple carbohydrates like pasta and rice and chips and crackers and pies and cakes and donuts coming into the body. The body always wants to hang on to sugar. It's a valuable energy source. So if you have more than what you need, it's going to turn it into a fat known as triglycerides. It also lowers something called good cholesterol or HDL. So if you really want to dive into this and you really want a good idea of what's going on here, I recommend this book here. It's called The Great Cholesterol Myth. And it's written by two cardiologists. Uh, one of them, last name Sinatra. I don't think you'll forget that one. So if you want, uh, this is a very good read. And it really helps you understand everything that we're discussing here. So this is all cutting edge information. Let's look at cholesterol and what it is good for. As I mentioned, the cell membranes. So cholesterol is important for strengthening the cell walls, assisting the body in exchange of nutrients and waste materials across those membranes. And let's just stop there for a second. If those cell walls became too thin, would that affect the health of the cell or all cells? Well, absolutely. And could even allow toxins and more toxins and chemicals and hormone disruptors to enter the cell. Those cell walls have to be a certain thickness for a reason uh, to withstand the onslaught of a very toxic world. So if you think about that logically, I don't know if we want it too low. This could be a big mistake because then those toxins and chemicals could get inside the cell, affect even your DNA, and we start making disrupted DNA copies of ourselves or our cells, uh, we start running into new diseases, like the number two killer in North America. Think about cholesterol, conducting nerve impulses through the brain and the spinal cord. Well, what would happen if the covering of a nerve made from cholesterol was too thin or not enough? Would that affect our nervous system, our ability to think and to focus? Things like dementia. You get the idea. Cholesterol is also good for making the skin resistant to those chemicals I talked about. Also outside organisms. And here's the big one. It helps your skin 
convert sunlight into vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is very powerful at fighting cancer, strengthening the bones. It has a lot of different uh, immune properties. So if we don't have enough cholesterol, we don't get some sunshine, you can imagine the problems we're running into. And vitamin D3 levels uh, are very much in question today that we're not getting enough. We're like plants. We've got to go outside. We've got to get some sun. If we lived underground, uh, we would cease to exist. And cholesterol is good for maintaining proper fat digestion. So is it really a demon? I think you're starting to understand it's not. So we have to look at cholesterol and understand why does it become bad? Why is it such a focus in the cardiovascular system? Well, it's because cholesterol can become something called oxidized. And oxidation really means that those molecules are becoming different. Uh, they're becoming rogue or bad. Oxidation happens when we are exposed to chemicals and toxins and poisons. Uh, antioxidants, which we find in food like fruits and vegetables and berries, help prevent our cholesterol from becoming oxidized. So if we don't get enough of that in the diet, and look at what a lot of people eat in the grocery stores, look at their carts. How much antioxidants do you see in the cart? School lunch programs, you get the idea. So if we're not getting plenty of antioxidants, we risk oxidized cholesterol. What happens if it's oxidized? Cholesterol becomes very sticky. It becomes thick. And sticky cholesterol equals sticky arteries. Now we have congestion. So if you take a second, as I mentioned in the beginning all the way back to what happens if you get resistance, blockage, congestion in the cardiovascular system. It's going to increase the heart pressure. You can start to see why some of these symptoms start happening. 56 million Americans on a prescription statin at this time as I'm talking. That's a lot of people when you consider the populations. So that's one answer that people know much about. But I think now you have a different understanding that cholesterol has a good side and the bad side is lack of antioxidants. So we're all fat heads, right? Our brains are 60% fat. That's a good thing, but that's a good fat, not a bad fat. It's interesting to note that around the age of 50, as we get older, naturally, naturally our cholesterol will go up. And it's to help us reduce dementia. So we can remember where our car keys are, right? So let's say you are older, you get a cholesterol test, and suddenly they're coming at you with prescription. Makes you wonder. So like the lady on the plane to Nanaimo, 53 years of age, wondering why her cholesterol has gone up. Is it sugar? Is it that she's leaking? Or is it to help protect her brain? So cholesterol is not the demon. Again, oxidized is. We don't want that. So hopefully you're starting to think about this totally different than what you've heard or read. So let's just look at this total cholesterol, right? Because a lot of times that's looked at. And we'll get into the HDL, LDL part in a minute. But high cholesterol is only one of 250 heart disease risk factors. So if we focus just on one, and that's all we're tackling, we still have 249 to go. But this statistic right here, I think, says it all to help you understand where I'm going. Half of all heart attacks occur in people with a normal cholesterol level. So cholesterol is not the demon. So could the heart attack of these 50% people with normal cholesterol have been from the other 249? Well, of course. So we don't have the full picture here when it comes to the cardiovascular system. Hence, that's why we're talking about this. And look at the last statistic. One in five kids have very poor what's called LDL, or low-density lipoprotein. That's kind of the bad cholesterol. And even if we were to look at LDL, if you went back and read that book, The Great Cholesterol Myth, you would find out that not all LDL is bad. 
that there are three kinds of LDL, and there's only one kind that is harmful. And yet, when we test LDL, we don't break it down into those three components. But studies have shown one in five children have this poor LDL by the age of 14. And why is that happening? Uh, standard American diet. If we look at just LDL and we break it down, we say that's the only thing we're going to focus on. And we know that statins can help lower LDL, and so can a lot of naturals. So can diet, lifestyle, exercise, don't smoke. There's a lot of factors, 250. But there is new analysis uncovering the relationship between lowering this LDL too far as we focus on that more and more and more. Journal of American College of Cardiology talked about this. It said, yeah, statins are some of the most widely prescribed medications worldwide. They have beneficial cardiovascular benefits. However, what they found out is that treatment with those statins had zero effect on strokes. And what they found out is suddenly there were new cancer diagnoses, which were more frequent by using statins. In layman terms, if you lower the LDL, there was an increase of cancer. Remember I said there are three different kinds of LDL. Two of them are actually good. One is actually bad. So we're not looking at the whole picture. If you look at the Framingham Heart Study in 2012, and this is a very good study, we have 201 people with cancer and 201 people without, over an average of 18.7 years. That's a good study, nice and long. And they concluded low LDL was found in all cancer participants, but was not found in the ones without a low LDL. So new analysis, new information, we're starting to see things are different than what we've been told. So if it's not cholesterol levels that are critical, what is? Well, we already talked about triglycerides. Remember, we saw that, that sugar can be a big problem. And again, not all sugars, because you need some sugar from your diet. You got to run that brain. You got to have energy. But if we get too much sugars, simple sugars, simple carbs into the body, we make triglycerides. So that's an indicator, I think a powerful one. One of those 250 risk ratios that you should pay attention to is triglycerides. If you've got a high triglyceride level, you need to focus on your diet. If we have good cholesterol, and good cholesterol is known as high-density lipoproteins, we are going to be better off. We're going to live longer and have less issues. It's the HDL that's important. So what are we talking about? We want low triglycerides. We want a high HDL. This is what you should focus on when you're dealing with the cardiovascular system. Let's talk about that HDL. We talked about lowering the LDL wasn't a good idea if we got it too low. But what if we got the HDL high? So the good HDL, we are seeing that recent studies are showing us that high HDL carries bad fats out of the bloodstream. That's a good thing if we run into trans fats and nasty fats that we get through a diet, we don't know they're there. If we have high HDL, it can actually grab that and get rid of it. That's a good thing. But the big part here is that high density lipoproteins also reduce something called artery inflammation. And that is a huge point, a very huge point. Think about what inflammation means. It means heat, injury, pain. Right? And that happens in acute situations where we bang our knee and the knee may get swollen and red. And that's the body trying to send blood to something and to heal it. But when it becomes chronic or long term in the body, even the arteries, 100,000 kilometers of arteries or coronary arteries can become very inflamed. They get irritated. And when they're irritated, they're sending signals back to the human body and they're saying, hey, our arteries are on fire. We don't want to be on fire. So the body says, okay, well, we've got to put that out. What do you think it would use to do that? Cholesterol, triglycerides, because it uses it and it kind of sticks in that area. It's oxidized, sticky cholesterol, sticks to that area to kind of seal off and cool off an inflammation. Well, once you put the Band-Aid down, it kind of tends to stay there, and you start reducing the internal opening. Good news, 
high HDL can actually unclog the arteries. So if we could raise our high density lipoproteins, which carry bad fats and plaque and things out of the system, we could actually reverse the problem. That's powerful information. That coming from the Journal of American Medical Association in 2007. So that's a whole different way of looking at things. But let's back way up for a second. Let's just take a minute to let all this sink in and let's back up. We're going to back up to 1856. In 1856, there was a German physician who came to the United States to get his medical degree and he studied cardiology. And it was very fascinating because at that time, if someone died of a heart attack, they would do an autopsy, open up the coronary arteries and see a yellow, fatty, waxy substance inside the artery known as plaque. And they determined that that's what killed the individual. And they knew it was made of cholesterol. Dr. Virchow, being way ahead of his time in 1856, looked at it differently. He said, I think there's a different idea here. It's what came first, the chicken or the egg. He said, what I propose is that the arteries become inflamed. There's oxidation. He didn't know what that was at the time, but he said it got sticky. And it started to line those arteries as a natural uh, recourse for the body to calm the arteries down. And he said, that's what created the plaque. And you know what? He was right in 1856. But the American Medical Association, in its infinite wisdom, took away his medical degree and kicked him out of the United States because he was considered lunatic for that idea because there was no scientific proof. All they could see was visual evidence of plaque and how sad that was. Because if we just fast forward, we see now information, lots of information. This one coming out in 2004, 150 years later basically saying, guess what? We now know what the cause of coronary artery disease is or heart attacks. We also know what the cause of cancer and Alzheimer's and dementia and a lot of diseases is simply inflammation. Poor Dr. Virchow. Imagine what we would have done if we would have listened to him 150 years ago and how many lives and pain and suffering would have been prevented. What we know from this type of information now is inflammation is the cause of every disease known to man. So what's really going wrong here? Inflamed white blood cells become unstable and lesions and there are ruptures. So those coronary arteries get blocked up, lesions, and they rupture, they stroke, and we would trigger heart attacks. So we know that inflammation is what we need to probably be focused on first, not so much just cholesterol, which we consider a demon. Look at some of these other 250 cardiovascular risk ratios, things like obesity. Well, that's common sense. Smoking, genetic predisposition, right? If it runs in your family, you should be doing something about it now, not waiting to be a stat. High stress. Who doesn't have stress? And a highly processed, carbohydrate-rich diet, making more triglycerides. So you get the idea that, hey, we're not looking at the whole picture of what's going on, and yet 92 people are dying an hour. Now, one of the things the body does when inflammation has gone crazy is it has a response called C-reactive protein. It can actually be measured in the blood. Probably 9 out of 10 people you talk to have never had a C-reactive protein done. It's a simple blood test in the States. It costs 10 bucks, but you have to ask for it. That's pretty sad because I think if you found out whether this is normal or extremely high, you would know that, hey, I've got to get my inflammation under control or I'm going to have cardiovascular issues, not to mention all the other diseases known to man. So I think uh, you could almost propose why isn't this a standardized test, something called homocysteine homocysteine levels um, indicate that there can be cardiovascular risk ratios. Yet again, 9 out of 10 people don't have a homocysteine level checked. It's starting to come around. People are starting to ask for it. Homocysteine levels are very easy to fix. 
uh, it's called B vitamins or green foods. And then also something called fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is, is kind of your clotting factor. And the best analogy I can give you would be your blood can be too thick, it could be too thin, or it could be just right. Kind of like the three bears, right? So a lot of these very powerful informational notes are not being looked at. And yet, if you had that information, you could probably change the outcome of what can happen to you. Now, if we look at heart disease in general, it's a much greater threat to women. If we look over here at this blocked-in area, that's the one I, I think is very important. It says that only 3% of women believe they will die of cardiovascular disease, but in reality, 45% do. And conversely, 45% of women believe they'll die of breast cancer, but only 3% do. So I think that's an interesting statistic, that heart disease is the number one killer of women, and we have to start paying attention to that. That doesn't mean, men, that you get off easy. It's just understanding that that is a greater threat than breast cancer. We're going to recap just a little bit. The amazing pump, the heart, is the only organ in the body with its own type of cells. Okay, there are no other cells anywhere in the body outside of the heart itself that look like that or act like that. And what happens with the heart is as we are tiny, uh, we're, we're children, and we grow into adolescence. Those cells do expand a little bit so the heart can grow with you. But once you get about to puberty, the heart muscle cells are programmed to stop dividing. Now that's good news for cancer because remember way in the beginning when we talked about cell walls made of cholesterol become too thin, things can get inside the cell, damage DNA, you start making bad copies. Well, the heart doesn't do that. It's very rare to die of heart cancer. But it's bad news for myocardial infarction or heart attack. Bad news. Because again, those cells don't divide. So if any tissue in the heart is attacked, cut off from blood supply, like Dr. Birchow talked about, then that heart tissue itself will die and it cannot regenerate. Now that particular heart pumps about 7,500 liters a day through the body, that 100,000 kilometers. So it's doing a lot of work. And the heart rate and how it's working is affected by physical fitness, our activity. It's interesting to note, you know, how much activity do we need to get a cardiovascular benefit? Some people will say 20 minutes, half hour, two hours, three times a week. Uh, actually, there are studies now that say you can do it as little as one minute. One minute, but you've got to do it every day. And you've got to be very aggressive. That means you get up, you do 10 jumping jacks, you do 10 sit-ups, 10 abdominal crunches. You're very, 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 very intense for that minute to the point where you break out in a clammy sweat. And if you did that every minute, every day, the rest of your life, yes, it's been proven, scientifically proven, that will give you a cardiovascular benefit. I'm not promoting that because I do think you do need additional activity, riding a bike, swimming, walking, you get the idea. You need to do more than that. Um, so, men, don't, uh, don't get too happy out there. Our emotions are also something that tend to affect that heart. Think of the time you've ever had a broken heart and how that felt in your chest. Believe me, that affects your heart rate. All you've got to do is think about the person who broke your, heart, broke your heart in the past, and it will probably raise your blood pressure. The healthier your heart is, the lower the resting heart will be, and that's good because why make this thing work any harder to push that blood 100,000 kilometers if you don't have to? Uh, that will give you life extension. Hormones released because of emotions, other stimulus affect that rate. We talked about that. And that's why the heart was historically associated with the emotional content. So heart disease in general is just sometimes those artery walls become weak or they leak. And then they build up with fat and cholesterol, like a cut that needs to heal. They stiffen, they clog. The blood pressure goes up. We have inflammation. And then we have a heart attack or a stroke. So does that sound like cholesterol to you? I don't think so. The heart needs work like exercise to help correct itself and get this thing back in shape. 
So there's a lot to understand. So here's a little cartoon. What fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? So modern medicine may tend to disregard the damaging role of things like we talked about, C-reactive protein, homocysteine, fibrinogen, right? There we have the, the clotting factor, we have the inflammation factor, we have the lack of green leafy vegetables and B vitamins. And we tend to focus more on cholesterol or LDL, which we've already shown you is not the whole picture. Lifestyle, yes, this is important. You can't be a couch potato. Genetic predisposition, of course, that's important. You know, if it runs in your family, uh, you need to be doing something, not just sitting there thinking about it, but actually going after this problem. And they tend to favor more things like medications and surgery. But yet they're not looking at the other 200 and some odd risk factors, some of those which we talked about today. This is just a little chart that talks about what is fibrinogen level, C-reactive protein level, homocysteine, glucose, iron, cholesterols, yes, they are, can be important, triglycerides, or even DHEA, which is a youth hormone. And uh, some of these ranges, you know, may not be in um, Canadian diagnostics. Uh, they can be converted. But it gives you an idea of what we consider standard in the middle here. Um, I would tend to go more towards the optimal side if you can get there. For example, C-reactive protein, you can see standard, well, up to 4.9 um, milligrams per liter. We'll kind of consider that standard. But the optimal may be under two. Um, in the States, we even look to try to get it under one. Uh, why have inflammation, as you know? Here's a little cartoon that just kind of iterates the whole medication side effect, right? Each capsule contains your medication plus a treatment for each of its side effects. Pretty hard to swallow. Let's talk just a little bit about prescription side effect, you know, because statins are very well known and used throughout the world. But here there was a 2008 study where they took muscle cells and exposed them to 40 milligrams of simvastatin. And what they found was that new muscle cell growth was reduced by 50%. That's pretty startling because a lot of side effects that happen uh, from medication, especially this medication can be liver problems, kidney problems, and also muscle pain and fatigue. Well, now you see, based on the study, we're providing proof that it's affecting the muscle. And that's because those muscle cells have something called a mitochondria inside of them. And a mitochondria is like a, a little tiny generator, like a little tiny powerhouse. And its job is to make energy. It uses a very important nutrient to do that, something called CoQ10, coenzyme Q10, to make energy. Interesting part we know now, based upon these studies, is that the statin tends to block CoQ10. Hence, the muscle cell growth is diminished, and we get muscle pain and fatigue, and we're tired. Well, if 100 trillion cells don't make energy, you don't have energy. Another important factor that we have not touched on yet is something called nitric oxide. Sounds a little bit toxic, but it's not. It's a gas produced naturally by all of our cells, and it uses a nutrient or an amino acid called arginine. And this plays a very critical role in maintaining the health of the entire cardiovascular system, the whole 100,000 kilometers. It keeps the blood vessels strong, flexible, properly dilated to ensure continuous delivery of blood, oxygen, and nutrients to every living cell in the human body. And if we look at this little picture over here on your right, vessels without increased nitric oxide become very strict, unopening, tiny. The inside diameter becomes very small. And therefore, what would happen to the pressure? Probably go up, correct? We look where we have increased nitric oxide. You can see the inside diameter is much larger. You can see that the vessel is dilating and allowing blood flow to go through the body at a much quicker, easier pace than when we don't have this important aspect of nitric oxide. 
So this becomes very important in understanding how we keep this thing flowing like a river versus stagnation. Okay, arginine is what does that. The interesting part is we lose a lot of arginine in our foods because they're overly processed and they're overly cooked. So we don't always get adequate levels. If you look at this diagram over here on the right, this is exactly how they figured out the medication Viagra. So nitric oxide. The production declines with age, so as the older we get, we will start to lose some of that production. It also requires that essential amino acid arginine from dietary sources. So imagine if we could provide nitric oxide, we would actually help anti-aging. So decline in nitric oxide production leads to things like hardening and stiffening of the artery, leading to a reduction in blood flow throughout the body. We are no longer circulating properly. Lifestyle, we know, is key. We do need to exercise. We talked about that. Even if it's one minute intense every single day the rest of your life, or it's 20 minutes here three, four times a week, whatever, you need to move. You need fresh air. Spend 90% of your life indoors. Get outside, breathe some air. Unless maybe you're in Alberta or Manitoba this time of year, you might want to think different. But release stress. We've all got to do that. And diet and nutrition. We want a good fat diet. Remember, we're fat heads. Our brains are full of good fat. But we don't want a low-fat diet. We're actually harming the body. It's been talked about and agreed to that probably 30% of your diet needs to be a good fat. I often tell people an avocado a day may keep the cardiologist away. Diet soda, 61% increase in cardiovascular disease. We need to back off on this. We need more veggies, right, and maybe not necessarily cooked. Maybe slightly steamed is okay, but about seven a day. We need good grains. We need lean meats. But this is a pretty powerful stat. This came out of British Medical Journal, 2014 in Oxford. And they looked at taking an apple a day for people over the age of 50. They found they could pre prevent 8,500 strokes or heart attacks a year, which is relatively the same number that they attribute to using statins. So put a statin in one hand, put an apple in the other, and you decide. Supplementation. Supplementation does become important because, as I mentioned, too much of our foods are processed and refined, boxed and canned in styrofoam. We've got too much garbage coming into the system. It's overcooked. It's, it's overprocessed. And we lose those valuable nutrients like CoQ10. We lose those valuable nutrients like arginine. Well, how can we run a major system? And last but not least, and then we'll get into the actual discussion of supplementation, but let's talk about some simple nuggets of truth. Chromium. They took chromium, and they started applying this in the study. You use a GTF form, and they, they saw that it reduced something called insulin resistance at the cell. Now, insulin resistance just means the cell is not allowing its own natural insulin into the body to balance blood sugar. Interesting. If you back all the way up to the beginning when you started this webinar, some of that cholesterol is used to build cell walls. Now if the cell wall becomes too thin, it's not working properly. It may shut down and not allow anything in, including its own hormones. And what are hormones made of? Cholesterol. What's a cell wall made of? Cholesterol. You get the idea. Chromium is one of those minerals that helps with the integrity of the cell wall. And they noticed when they used it that the insulin resistance dropped but what they didn't expect was, in turn, it reduced their overall cholesterol levels that were high. Isn't that interesting? Remember, cholesterol levels go up to heal leaks and to build cell walls. American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Low-carb diet resulted in a better lipid profile, like triglycerides. That's no shock. Psyllium hulls, which is just fiber, right, improved insulin and cholesterol, similar to the chromium. And then this one, really huge. Bees, there's your homocysteine. They used straight niacin. The Journal of American Medical Association did this in 2000, 15 years ago. And they found 85% of people stopped insulin that were type 2 diabetic. But they weren't expecting, and they noted, what else dropped? Their cholesterol prescription. They no longer needed it. Isn't that interesting? So again, are we looking at all 
of the 250 cardiovascular risk ratios? Probably not. So we're just going to take a second here um, to stop. Uh, hang on for just like 10 seconds. I need to take a drink. Ah, just had some water. Okay, cute little picture here, right? All right, let's get into something more in-depth that may be very beneficial to you and, in my opinion, helps save lives. And that's supplementation. It can be very valuable if you know how to use it and what to use. This is a blend from Nature Sunshine called MC. And how this came about is very interesting. Nobody, nobody in the world knows what optimal nutrition is. I've got three PhDs, as Ron should introduce me and told you about that, and I cannot find clinical substantiated evidence done in laboratories about what is actually considered optimal. There's a lot of information about recommended daily allowance for preventing things like scurvy and beriberi and pellagra. We know what you have to have as a minimum. There is some idea on what's standard, but nobody knows what is optimal. And that's because there's not a lot of money in studying vitamins and minerals and fats uh, to know how much we should all really be getting. I think, and you can say you've heard it here first, that in the future you will see that even things like vitamin D3 levels we're not uh, getting enough of. Linus Pauling, you saw, talked about healing leaks, the discoverer of vitamin C. Said 10,000 milligrams a day of vitamin C was what he would recommend as optimal. Uh, seeing you won a Nobel Prize, probably should pay attention to what he's saying. Um, but look at here, vitamin C, known to reduce plaque in arteries. Known to reduce plaque in arteries. We have the B vitamins. There's your homocysteine levels. Loaded with heart-friendly nutrients. So this formula, this vitamin and mineral supplement, was designed with this in mind. And the interesting part is they used this type of formula with people and they kind of went as building it up. So you're going to see that with this particular product you can use it as a daily or you can use it in what's called a build up. First the daily. If you just follow the recommendation of what's on the label and use that as a daily vitamin mineral, uh, basically what you're doing is providing uh, uh, more of a standard or close to optimal nutrition for what the cardiovascular system needs every day. So you could take that every day for life if you wanted to. Or you can use it more of what's called a build-up. And that's pretty interesting. Uh, my wife, who's a type 1 diabetic, uses this particular formula all the time because they're at great risk for cardiovascular builds up. Uh, my mother-in-law, who had some carotid artery build-up, uh, uses this particular combination. Build-up just simply means uh, you work from a small amount to like three, six, nine, kind of get up to like nine a day, and you just stay on that for a couple months or as long as you feel okay with taking that amount, and then you work your way back down. So it can be done as a build-up. And when you do that and start getting larger amounts of these nutrients in there, they actually help to do exactly what we're saying up here, known to help reduce plaque in the arteries. So it can kind of help get in there and melt away and release some of these you know, bad things in the body, helping HDL to come up to remove bad fats, helping reduce inflammation because we have a very high antioxidant value here. You don't want to oxidize cholesterol. Lowering homocysteine. So all of those things, fibrinogens, all the things that we talked about that we're not paying attention to are being looked at with this particular supplement. So keep that in mind as you educate about MC and the use of MC. Loaded with antioxidants. And antioxidants are very important throughout this presentation. I'll be back to it again. Molecules slow or prevent oxidation in the body. Scavenge free radicals accumulated by the body. What does that do? It benefits virtually every organ and every body system because they mop up these damaging free radicals that can tear us down, oxidize cholesterol, and make us age, and cause aches and pains. You get the idea. This is an excellent product, this MC, which can be used uh, for this. Another supplement I mentioned, 
back when we talked about how muscle cells can be reduced. All cells in the body can be reduced because they use a very important vitamin slash enzyme slash antioxidant called CoQ10. They all use this to make energy. This supplement is the most widely studied supplement on planet Earth, and they can't find a thing wrong with it. That's because it's used by all 100 trillion cells in the body. But remember when I talked about mitochondria? A lot of our cells in the body have a couple mitochondria here and there, but the heart itself and other areas of the body have much higher concentrations of mitochondria. Those cells need to make more energy than maybe a skin cell or a hair cell. You get the idea. The heart's going to have to use a lot of energy. It's going to use a lot of CoQ10. It's got to keep going. It's got to push blood 100,000 kilometers. So it's a vitamin E-like compound found in all cells of the body, especially the heart and the brain. Interesting part, whenever these levels are low, they're consistently seen in patients with cardiovascular concerns. So it's a master antioxidant found in the heart and even the brain. I mean, we find it all over, but even the gums. It's a lot of people that I work with that have gum issues. Maybe they're bleeding or they're receding. This is a supplement I'm thinking of immediately. Now, good CoQ10 is made differently than CoQ10 that's questionable. When I said this is the most widely studied supplement on planet Earth, a lot of the studies were done years ago with a different form of CoQ10 that was a little more water-soluble. Nature Sunshine uses a more fat-soluble ingredient CoQ10 called ubiquinol, and that's important. Those that really study the supplement know that it has to be fat-soluble for better absorption, and it doesn't break down as easy. We also add a little flaxseed oil to this, and so each capsule has 50 milligrams of ubiquinol plus a little bit of flaxseed oil. Why is that important? Because it gives it a higher bioavailability and a higher efficacy rate than the old forms. So sometimes, and you've got to keep this in mind, studies you may be looking at 10 years ago were using a form that wasn't very bioavailable. So even the milligrams that they recommend uh, aren't the same milligram as this, which is way more bioavailable. So in essence, um, this is doing double work. You can do the math on that one. CoQ10 is naturally occurring. We talked about that. You get it through foods, like maybe a 16-ounce ribeye, but yet we cook the ribeye. And then what happens? We denature the CoQ10, so we're not getting enough. And it's found in nearly every cell in the body. Notice it's a scavenger of free radicals, so it's an antioxidant. Inhibits oxidation. You don't want oxidized cholesterol. Helping stem damage to cell membrane. You don't want things getting in that you don't want to get in. We can, and also helping with our DNA. We don't want to be making bad copies. Everything that I've talked about is helped by products like MC and now CoQ10. Notice here it's working on low-density lipoproteins in a positive direction. And last but not least, I think this is critical, it even regenerates other antioxidants. In other words, it makes them work twice as hard. So you kind of need this in the body in adequate levels. So in the cardiovascular issue, and as I said in the beginning, I was teaching all across Canada last week, um, there were a lot of people who walked up to me and said, well, you've mentioned a couple different products. You know, which one should I use? Well, the answer is all of them. Uh, two more I'll mention in a minute. But if you had to pick one, that's really hard, but this might be pretty much tied for first. Remember that nitric oxide thing we talked about? This is the third supplement. That nitric oxide helps with dilation of vessels to get blood flow properly. We said we don't get enough because of our foods being denatured, overprocessed, and cooked. So we have a supplement called Arginine Plus. Notice the berries in here, right? So we've got a high antioxidant formula providing arginine. So we've got nine essential amino acids, including that arginine for nitric oxide production, getting the blood to flow properly, helping the body to not oxidize, anti-aging. We promote upper blood flow throughout the brain and the body. And this is a wonderful thing that you can add to just about anything, smoothies or just as a daily drink, or if you're trying to cut back on, we talked about diet sodas, this would be the best replacement. 
And number four, last but not least, and I want to thank you for hanging in there, but this one's pretty important too, it's something called Zambrosia. Nature Sunshine does a lot of different testing on their products, and it's important that you also have third-party testing. You can see up there, we'll talk about uh, the Brunswick Labs. This is an independent study to make sure it's certified for what we want it to do. There are a lot of competitors that make a formula similar to this, but it doesn't hold a candle uh, to what we have here. So all these big words, you can read them yourself, basically just say, I mop up free radicals. I stop the damage to the body. I help the inflammation and oxidation that's happening to the body. But the last one I want to point to is down here in the bottom called Xanthones. It's very interesting that this product, and you'll see it in a minute, uses a fruit from Thailand called mangosteen. And a lot of companies, what they would do is squeeze the mangosteen. They would squeeze the mangosteen, and what would happen is just the juice would come out. Okay? Well, what Nature Sunshine did is they looked at the covering of the fruit. And this is called the pericarp. And they said, well, maybe we shouldn't throw the rind away. Let's look at the rind and see what's in there. And what they found was an antioxidant called xanthones. Nature Sunshine was the first one to discover this. They actually sent their studies to DuPont University in the United States and actually were written up in clinical journals as identifying an antioxidant that nobody knew about. So these antioxidants support the immune system, the structure, the digestive system, the brain, and the skin. Um, you know, my father was very interesting, lived a long life, uh, but he was diagnosed with cancer in 1990, and he lived 12 years, and they gave him six months. And it was interesting because going forward, I would watch him, and he would eat a whole orange, and he would eat the peel and all. And if you've ever tried that, it's very difficult to do. But I always said, what are you doing eating the peel? And he said, well, I never saw a horse peel an apple. Remember we saw that statistic from Oxford, right, about an apple a day? He said, because there's got to be something in the rind or the covering, because that's the way the animals eat it. And I always thought he was right. Well, here is actual scientific proof that there's something contained within the pericarp. So mangosteen, a fruit, red fruit from Thailand, is what we're using as the first ingredient. And Zambrosia uses the whole fruit, including the pericarp, because we want those xanthones. So what does that do? It gives us a more powerful, powerful antioxidant than what competitors have. So xanthones offer powerful immune and cardiovascular support. So you may find a little bit of tiny pieces and chunks inside the Zambrosia. Just swallow those. We also see in Zambrosia something called decaffeinated green tea, grape seeds and skins. And you've heard about that, right? The paradox, the French paradox. Uh, wolfberry, goji, apples, raspberries, blueberries, red grapes. There's that apple from Oxford. And when we add all these things to mangosteen, you get something called synergy. It amplifies, or, or not just doubles, but quadruples the effect of the antioxidants. So here we've got something that, you know, remember those one in five kids? They're eating poorly. Give them a shot of this every day. You got to up the ante. If we have cardiovascular problems, we have C-reactive protein, homocysteine, all these different things that I've talked about, these four supplements is exactly what we're talking about. And they all tackle everything that we just talked about. So it's, it's very fascinating. So I hope you have found that this presentation has taken the cardiovascular system and put it in a whole different perspective and you have information that you didn't have before. You have ideas on what to do. So long may you live, Canada, and I hope God blesses your socks off. Have a great day.